Um, CalIT2, as many of you might know, was founded in the year 2000, dedicated to the integration of information technology with other disciplines within the university system. Um, I think it was always imagined to, to mature into an incubator that have become common across the United States and other countries. Um, in 2006, we had the first presentation in, in this series of, of uh, presentations called the Igniting Technology Series. Th those are the series that, that we uh, specifically sponsor, and this one may be the 26th now that we've done. It's been 11 years. And um, we were very happy to be part of uh, the, the maturation of Cal IT2 into uh, spawning Tech Portal in 2010. And it's now been seven years, and um, I think GP is going to talk about we've, uh, Tech Portal has launched 17 projects, uh, which is a fantastic success. My firm is interested in sponsoring Cal IT2 because we specialize in intellectual property. So we have about 300 attorneys that specialize in intellectual property. Um, the vast majority of us are patent attorneys. Uh, you know, and a patent attorney is someone who helps uh, someone obtain a patent on an invention. So tonight, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how um, people involved W with um, projects in incubation can help build the foundation of a high value patent portfolio. So, you know, why is this an issue? Th there is an opportunity at the very beginning of a project um, to participate in building the foundation of the, of the patent rights. And <clears throat> let, me, let me hear some numbers thrown out. W of the people here, involved in projects, what is going to be the value of your project in 20 years from now? Just yell out some numbers. A billion. A billion. I love that. That's a great number. It's a little dated because I think if you think forward, it should be 10 billion, right? <laughs> okay, well, 10 billion. Let's keep that number in mind. Um, today, to get an excellent patent application drafted, it's no less than $12,000, could be up to $25,000, depending on what it is. And that's where the patent attorney 100% drafts the entire application. And you have to understand, when you're a student or you're involved with a university project and the university is paying all the bills, the attorney represents the university and not you. They do not represent the project, the startup, the corporation, no one else except the university. So the attorney doesn't answer to you if you're the inventor or part of the project. They only answer to the university and they have to work within the bounds and the budget set by the university. But you as inventors and, in, and people involved with the startup can help draft the patent application. In fact, you can write about three quarters of it with little training. And what that results in, if you can draft three quarters of the patent application, you can end up with an excellent patent application for $6,000, which might be much more in line with the university budget. And this is, this is perfectly acceptable under uh, many university policies that I'm familiar with. So let's just talk about the patent for a while, and we, I want to demystify it a little bit. You know, a patent is only ever was only ever designed to really do one thing for the owner, and that's to give the owner the legal right to exclude other people from commercial use of a specific technology. And they're designed, the way they're written, they're written in a way to specifically allow a court, in other words, non-technical people to read them and understand the technology and be able to identify what technology, what commercial activity, is excluded. And that's, that's something hard to do. That means you have to write a patent application so just about anyone could understand it if they read it slowly enough. So if you, with that in mind, I, I'm very confident, and I, we've done this with students and, and young and old alike, you can 
a lay person can write three quarters of a patent and take a lot of that uh, activity away from the patent attorney. So, but it's not the whole application, it's specific parts of it. So let's talk about the parts of a patent. There's a description, the detailed description of the invention, and it usually has these two parts, okay? This part and this part. The horizontal part, let's, let's imagine that to be hardware, okay? Whenever I draft a patent application, I usually draw the hardware in a sequence going left to right, because that's the way we read. Things go in on the left and out on the right. And it almost doesn't matter what kind of technology it is, but if it's, but you know, it takes other forms as well. Let's say that's hardware. And software is usually depicted as a flow chart going top to bottom. So this is hardware and software. Can everybody do this? Hardware, just put your hand up in the air. Hardware, hardware, software. That's the description. Hard, this is not religious. It's just hardware, software. That's the easy, relatively easy part to draft, but it takes a long time. It's not hard to understand how to do it, it's just time consuming. But this part down here at the bottom, this is a claim. The claims of a patent are those, this small part of the patent, maybe just a quarter of the patent or less, that actually defines the scope of protection that the patent provides, all right? So it turns out drafting a description of a patent is 90% sweat, 10% strategy. But drafting the claims is 90% strategy and 10% sweat. So the inventors, if you help draft the description, you can let the patent attorney focus on the claims. And if you see the claims are made up of little blue dashes, or the rounded corners, right? Well, all those little blue dashes are actually, all of those little blue dashes come from here. They come from the hardware and the software. So we need, we need these descriptions in order to be able to write the claims, okay? Are you getting it? Hardware, software, claims. So you leave the claims for the patent attorney. So, how does, how does this play out in a real world example? Uh, lots of people have heard of Massimo. Let's talk about pulse oximeter patents. The hardware of a pulse oximeter patent would have maybe a driver, an algorithm, and a sensor. And the method of operation would be issue, emit a pulse, detect a reflection, calculate oxygen saturation. And in, a, in the patent, context, this would be written with an extreme level of detail with lots of, you know, showing all the parts of the driver, all the, you know, calculations in the algorithm, all the different parts of the sensor, and then generally how it works and in detail how each step of the process works. Then the claims, now starting with that good description that goes in all the nooks and crannies of the system, we might write claims that cover a pulse oximeter system an algorithm, a driver, and a sensor. That's because those are basically, you know, these things. And maybe a method, a pulse oximetry method. But it turns out in the commercial world, the sensor is where all, a lot of the revenue is generated. The vast majority of the revenue comes from the sensor. So we might decide to increase the value of this portfolio to write more claims about sensors. So what, it, and when I say that, e you can imagine each one of these circles represents a different patent that all are based on the very first patent application. If it was written well, if enough time was spent on drafting that first patent, you can, ex you can keep working on it and develop lots of patents that cover all the different parts of the system as well as you can, because how much is your technology worth? $10 billion? a billion dollars, that's what your goal is here, is to create an enforceable product that'll last for 20 years and protect your market share. Here's a, here's a schematic diagram of Massimo's patent portfolio that won a billion dollars in jury verdicts. Okay, there's one patent application at the far left. That was the first one. That's the one that was written really well. And 
what we did is we built a, a portfolio of 31 patents based on this first one. 31. And at the end, by 2000, so this was filed in uh, around 1997. And by 2015, we had won a billion dollars in jury verdicts, much, much more in confidential settlements, and we're able to stop competitors to keep them out of this market. Many of these patents are about sensors that fit on your fingertip. Some of them are about the driver. Some of them are about the algorithm. But that's, that's my point here. So if you're involved in a, a project that's being incubated and you have a limited budget to spend on your patent filings, you should be involved in that process as much as you can and help where you can. So the first thing to, to do would be read patents. You have to, in order to be helpful, you gotta start to write like a patent. Reading them is really easy, they're free. If you just go on Google patents, you can get a, there's you know, eight million patents out there to choose from. Look up patents that are related or the patent attorney can easily provide you with samples. Then ask the attorney for a free lunch and a lesson on how to draft a patent application. We'd be glad to do it. In fact, we do it all the time. We can have you come to our office, sit in a conference room, we'll have lunch, and we'll just do a lesson on how to write a patent application. So then the idea is we, we would give you a lesson on the project you're working on so you can write it yourself. But this might take you 40 or 50 hours of your time. So you have to plan ahead. It can't be at the last minute. So if you're approaching that date of when you've got to get your application on file, start three months ahead. Learn, you know, work with us. Learn how to do it and help. Then what, what are you going to draft? What, what's this? Hardware and the software. That's what you guys are going to draft. We'll draft the claims. And at the end, you know, we'll, we'll have an excellent patent application that's on budget. And hopefully, it will provide you the protection that you hope to have in, by, you know, 20 years. And, you know, when, when companies go to acquire startups, they look at the patent applications and they can tell when they're done poorly. And when they're done on too small of a budget, it shows and it can't be fixed later, okay? That's why I'm bringing this up at all. It cannot be fixed later. So, that's, that's, that's my message for tonight. Feel free to ask me afterwards. If anybody wants a lesson, happy to do it. We're just down the road from here. Um, and now, let's get on with the rest of the show. So I'd like everyone to uh, give a warm welcome to GP Lee, the director of Cal IT2. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good evening. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for coming to uh, tonight's Igniting Technology event. And I, I hope you can hear me in the back. And before I start uh, my presentation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for coming to tonight's event. Allow us to have uh, uh, information exchange with you. I do believe to create such a ecosystem for innovation and entrepreneurship, it is a very crucial to have all you participate, right? We cannot just work alone. This is really about the ecosystem in Orange County. So in my presentation, it has a two part. One is to tell you our current tech portal, which is a pre-incubator, how we support the overall incubator system in Orange County ecosystem in Orange County. The second part, I'd like to also share with you some of the vision CAD2 is currently working on. We do see a lot of opportunity to work together to really ignite the economic growth in Orange counties. So I uh, remind you, the CAD2 is a mission statement. 
we innovate uh, the total solution for the benefit of society. And the way how we do that is to integrate different discipline with community and industry. We have to work together. But that's not only good, only doing the integration is not good enough. We like to also find alternative path for translating R&D success into the marketplace. So we also incubate the company within CAT2. Then at the end, we like to ignite economic growth. So to do that, this is based on the vision back in year 2000 with the governor's support of $100 million. And what you can see here is I am a professor on the left-hand side, the typical we have been viewed as an authority and because we teach students and we grade their homework, grade their exam. And, but one color we recognize as a professor is a white color because either we publish or we perish. But as you know, white color is composed of rainbow color. And we really like to help our professor, student, researcher to appreciate the rainbow color, especially the green color. That means money. How to translate the R&D success into the green color? From being a green person about business side, become really appreciate that green color. So we try to work with them, help them to appreciate that, and translate their R&D success into the marketplace. So at the end, their invention will get into the hand of the user to really benefit the society. So that is our vision. To do that, in CADI 2, we recognize we have to do that. And how we really create a co-invention um, space for our academic personnel as well as the business and community to work together. And we create this uh, tech portal back in year two, uh, 2010. So uh, in the last seven years, we have had 17 sub companies. They raised more than 15 to $20 million. Right. And the reason why they can do that, we do have a sugar daddy, our governments, they provide the SBIR, STTR funding. So as you know, professors are very good at writing proposals. So they do receive a substantial funding. And currently we have a five stop uh, in the tech portal, uh, and we can accommodate two more companies. And uh, some of the requirements for the staff to move into the tech portal space, they have to either license the UC's uh, technology invention or to be funded company to be funded by UCI faculty, staff, or students. And so um, one thing you recognize here is uh, most of the time for the staff company, they have a brilliant idea, like professors, they have an invention, and they have worked with uh, the law firm to have uh, the uh, patent. So what they need the next is uh, how do we really reduce the entry barrier for them to develop proof of concept and prototype. So within university, we do have affordable space uh, access to the shared use of facility. And also in Caddy 2, we do have a lot of skill for uh, staff to help the company to develop either hardware or software and so on. I think it's, that is how we can really help the company to ac accelerate their prototype development. In addition to, to that, we have a lot of events to uh, invite uh, people like you visit, and you are the, uh, the leader in business world or in investment world. So you see there is a value from their technical innovations and providing a handshake. That's how we can really jumpstart the whole thing. So that is a, the typical what we do in our pre-incubator. And the reason why we say it's a pre-incubator, as you know, in Orange County, we do have many successful incubators, like uh, Evo Nexus, uh, like uh, the Cove, uh, in Applied Innovation, K5, and Octans, and so on. Right? So we work very closely with them, and that's how we uh, do uh, the co-innovation. <coughs> so the next one I'd like to share with you, what we see, the greatest opportunity for us in Orange County Showing here is that we are right now at the fourth industrial revolution. And this is the fourth industrial revolution. Actually, it's focusing on the use of uh, information communication technology for the cyber physical space. And what is the most important of this uh, fourth industrial revolution is about data. 
data become new currency. So how do we really uh, capture that opportunity? So here I'd like to show you in the second industrial revolution with automobile and automations, you can tell here, this is on the street in New York City in 1900. It's only one car you can find, but by 1910, only one carriage. So when the technology disruption brought into the society, you can see such suddenly change. And we do believe this uh, data age is going to happen even at a faster pace than what we have observed. Okay, so think about that. This is a really coming, in, it's going to happen in front of our face. So how do we capture that opportunity? So this is uh, what we know in the last 10 years. Right? So the data was uh, generated for, for and by human like Google search or social media network, right? So, and today we all, we all talk about is data generated for and by machine. It's known as IoT, right? And you heard about the smart home, smart city, right? Because it's connected to the devices and it helped us to really uh, get better use of electricity and so on. But what is going to happen for tomorrow is really the connected service and the value. And that connected service and value, we will be able to use the data from different sectors of business, different sectors of industry, how those data can be used in a way to find a new value, a new service. And that is what we are looking for, and I do believe there are a lot of opportunities really as it's happening right now in Orange County. And so maybe after the um, uh, tonight's event, if you'd like to learn more, we can talk about it. So in order to support this uh, fourth industrial revolution in Cali 2, what we have been doing is we create in the front end for data collections, the IoT <coughs> uh, work. So we have uh, the seminar and we have a student uh, project. And so if you are interested in joining us, be a sponsor and come in to work as a mentor for our students. I think it's, that's what we need to do. And in addition to that, to lower the innovation barrier, we do have uh, so-called DIY, do it yourself for the uh, machine shop, for the uh, electronic lab and so on. And you can come in to use it with very low access fee. In addition to that, because this is really the data generation, a lot of is happening. We are working with a lot of software company. And for example, IBM has a 200 uh, license available to, to us to use uh, their blue mix Watson machine uh, for the uh, deep machine learning. And we are working with uh, Google using their DPU, right? So the AlphaGo, that is, uh, it will be available to us for use. In addition to that, in order to visualize all the big data in the visualization area, AR, VR, and within Cali2, we are also developing the deep machine learning lab. And we are working with uh, NVIDIA, so it will be able to provide hundreds to thousands of distributed GPU for deep machine learning. So those are the resources will be available to the community, so we welcome you to work with us, and you, if you see there is a need for, for your uh, uh, company work, and come to talk to us. So thank you. I, my time is up. <laughs> so I would like to uh, introduce uh, the following uh, three speakers. So the uh, first one is Aditi, and she is going to tell you is in the pre-incubator before moving out of uh, our tech portal. And the second speaker uh, will be uh, talking about how they are making transition from the tech portal into uh, the, the incubator. And the last speaker we'll talk about is they have graduated from our pre-incubator and raised uh, a lot of money and from the angel, uh, from the uh, Series A fund. And they will share with you the experience at different stage of pre-incubator. So Aditi.
Good evening. Um, I am Aditi Majumdar. I'm the current CEO of Summit Technology Laboratory. Um, so the overview of my talk is kind of first I'll share with you the technology that we are developing and then I'll talk about uh, what made us launch this company. <clears throat> so, you know, of course, this is the, as GP kind of gave me a very nice segue for uh, my talk, um, data is everywhere today. To some extent, uh, data is inundating us and it is going to the level where we are having trouble processing all the data that is coming to us. So we are actually being ushered along with the data, we are being ushered into an age of experiences uh, you know about the VR and AR headsets, uh, which is creating new kinds of experiences for people, though we use it for probably mostly education and entertainment purpose today, probably in the future we will be actually using it for creating new experiences via which we will be providing data to people. Um, the VR and AR headsets, of course, are great providers of experiences, but they are primarily personalized experiences uh, where users are encumbered by devices. Uh, they still suffer from virgin's accommodation problem because of which you cannot really use them for a very long duration. And of course, you know, you kind of get inhibited social interaction. <clears throat> uh, what Summit Technology Laboratory wants to create um, is what we call communicative spaces. So we envision that people should not be needing to wear any wearable devices, but they would have multi-user interactive experiences on real objects and spaces, which objects can be of any arbitrary shape or size. So I'm hoping that I have intrigued you enough right now. And so the next question is, well, you know, how does it really work? So think of if you have a vase like this. We, we say that this vase has some story to tell, right? So suppose you create a rig of projectors around the vase and you are lighting this vase with some projected imagery. You also put a bunch of cameras, which are feedback cameras. So what does the feedback camera do? First, it registers images. What that means is when you have, which one is the, yeah, when you have multiple projectors here, here you see we are actually having a curved arbitrarily shaped surface, six projectors. At any point on the surface here you are seeing two different projectors projecting. Actually this point has four different projectors projecting. They have to project the same content, otherwise you would get an image like this, which doesn't look seamless. Of course, the color also varies greatly. These are very commodity devices. So the registration means if you have a feedback camera looking at this, you can figure out how I can change the image going into the projector so that I can create a display which looks like it is being created by a single projector which, which has no color variations and is absolutely stitched as if it's coming from a single projector. So that is the first goal that the cameras help us achieve. The second one is because now the cameras are looking at the object, you can start interacting with the object. So for example, if you're putting your hand in the middle, the camera can see it and there can be an interpretation based on ap your application based on which the object will react to your interaction. So I'm going to show a video, oh, oh, sorry. So many of you probably have seen something called projection mapping. Have any of you seen some things like this? Okay, so if you have seen this, like you have seen probably shows where big, big projectors are projecting or big facades or architectures, probably in Vegas or any concerts. And you may be wondering, you know, how are we different? What is new, right? Because people are doing this, and so what, is, what are we doing new? The difference is, you know, whenever these kind of shows are happening, they are usually happening at a multi-million dollar price point. They are big productions, which people are using for, um, uh, um, uh, using for concerts. So, in, so we deliver this at consumer price point. We make it portable, and we have interactivity. 
We have tremendous ease in deployment on any shape and size. For example, we can do it on wraparound objects. Basically, we have an exclusive software IP which harnesses the power of many projectors without having the user worry about it. And therefore, because you can harness the power of many projectors, you can operate in ambient lighting. Because you can keep projecting as many projectors together and create very bright light. So here is an um, example. Uh, show you a short video of our systems. So the possibilities are numerous. Of course, you can take an object like this, and with a mobile, you can make it look like something like this. Or if you can, you can actually design different kind of shoe designs and have it manufactured. Um, so there are many application areas, education, entertainment, low-cost training systems for law enforcement or manufacturing low-cost interactive visualizations. And we are exploring which kind of market we would like to address. Uh, kind of giving you a little bit of history of Cal IT2 and Tech Portal in this. Um, I joined UCI in 2003 as a faculty. I was one of the first faculty members for computer graphics and visualization. Um, I have been the member of VizLab in Cal IT2, and it was the only research space that I had till DBH came in in 2007. DBH is Donald Bren Hall, the new building for information and computer science next door. So because of Cal IT2 lab, I, wa I was able to build big systems to kind of research in this direction and of course got tremendous exposure through the visitors and the demos that I kept doing for Cal IT2. Uh, then I got a NSF career award uh, in 2009, which was kind of creating projection-based displays on any surface. We called it ubiquitous displays, uh, from which we have eight ish issued patents, which kind of form the core of IP for Summit. And of course, got a lot of encouragement from GP, a lot of encouragement from OTA, and finally launched the company in 2016. Applied for NSF SBIR and got it in fall, uh, in fall 2016 and received the funding early this year. And we started hiring our first engineers in winter 2017, moved into Tech Portal in 2017 spring. And it has been a tremendous learning curve so far and uh, let's hope we have a lot more going forward. Thank you.
Hello. Well, thanks for having me. I'd like to tell you about what I'm doing at Integra Devices. My name is Mark Bachman. I used to be a faculty here at UCI for a long time. I have since been freed, and now I'm having a great time uh, in the real world. Um, actually, I still teach here, though. I, I teach a class this, uh, this fall on sensors and micro devices. So Integra Devices is uh, a labor of love for me. Uh, we build advanced micro devices that enable amazing products for a smart planet. Uh, what we do is we build micro devices that cannot be built in silicon. And you'd be surprised how many devices you cannot build in silicon. I spent uh, 15 years of my life building micro devices, and much of that time was spent trying to build devices in silicon that really should never have been built in silicon. And so uh, during that time, I developed many new ways to build micro devices that don't rely on silicon fabrication processes. And uh, when you look at the opportunities, a lot of markets that need very small, very small devices. And when I say small, I mean about the size of a human hair. So, you know, less than a millimeter in size. It's the kind of size that we build. Okay. Um, and our first products uh, that we're developing are for the wireless telecom market, 5G, and also for IoT. And these are two gigantic mar markets. I'm sure you've heard about 5G. If you haven't, then you should know about it. It's huge. It's coming in the next five years. And of course, you've probably heard about the Internet of Things. Um, these are the founders. Uh, I teamed up with two, these two gentlemen here. They're both uh, seasoned experts uh, uh, in startup companies and in uh, taking companies and to acquisitions. So Paul Dillon is our CEO, 30 years of experience in uh, tech companies. And James Spoto is our chairman of the board, and he's also a seasoned entrepreneur as well as a businessman. Almost everybody in Irvine has worked for this man. So every time I meet someone, oh yeah, I used to work for James. And I'm in the middle here. I'm the, the tech guy bringing in 20 years of research and, uh, and intellectual property into the company. OK, so we have this technology that we have licensed from the university. And it's actually quite, um, quite uh, transformative. It actually allows us to do quite a lot of things. Uh, it's based on 15 years and about $20 million of research. Uh, I was fortunate to have a very large lab at the university. A lot of researchers, a lot of research projects going on, developing a lot of different things in this space. Uh, many patents have been issued on it, and, and uh, there's a few core patents that we've licensed. And uh, it, it leverages a, a very large industry to manufacture these things. So we're not building little things in a laboratory with graduate students assembling things under a microscope. But this is a very scalable uh, manufacturing technology. And it provides for the first time in 30 years a new scalable cost-effective batch manufacturing approach to miniaturization and integration at the microscale. So it seems really wonderful. Let me explain how it works. So we are using a, a technology called heterogeneous integration. Now, I don't want to get too into the technical details, but the way most things are, that are manufactured that are really small use a process called thin film fabrication. It's basically a semiconductor approach to building things where you take a wafer and you stick it in a chamber and you deposit layers down and then you etch a new pattern and so forth. It's extremely good for building microelectronic circuits. It's not that great for building mechanical devices and fluidic devices and so forth. So we use another process called heterogeneous integration. This is a relatively new manufacturing process that was developed by the semiconductor packaging industry. These are the guys that take those chips from the silicon and then they put packages on top of them. And because of the development of the iPhone, this industry had to really scale up its manufacturing and really create very high um, quality manufacturing. And now they can build things that are very small. But they don't. They build packages. They don't build devices. That's what we do. So we take their manufacturing technology and now apply it to building very small devices. And that, that allows us to build things that have a wide variety of materials in them, not just silicon and metal, but plastics, ceramics, metals, and so forth. And allows us to build things that are truly three-dimensional. And it allows us to leverage a large manufacturing base. So we don't have to invent a new kind of foundry. We can actually work with companies that already exist doing manufacturing. So that's really great. So it means we can do, we can actually be a fabulous company even though we're designing these manufacturing processes because we work with our partners to do the manufacturing after we've developed it. And when you go down this road, you suddenly discover you can build so many things. And we have built many, many different types of products over the 15 years that I was at UCI. And these are some pictures of those. But the beautiful thing is all these different things for medical applications, for telecom, for sensors, and so forth, they're all batch fabricated. That means they're built on panels. That means we build 10,000 at once, just like you do with a semiconductor wafer. So you get the benefit of a very scalable manufacturing process, even though we're building many, many different types of things. 
literally the same company that builds those microphones at the top can also build these gimbals at the bottom and the biomedical devices. And the, so the same manufacturing process just tweaked can build many different types of things. And in fact, that's the problem. These are some of the pictures of things we built. And we can build too many things. I mean, there's this, it's like going into a candy store and saying, okay, what are you going to eat? And there's all these different types of things that we have demonstrated using this manufacturing process. And this, I, we actually had to cut out some of the pictures because I wouldn't fit on this slide. So, um, so what we did in the company is we spent about a year trying to figure out what should we build first with this great technology. And we focused in on two major markets, and that is the millimeter, and, uh, millimeter wave and microwave markets, which is 5G, wireless telecom, and also um, the uh, IoT edge devices. So we have basically some really cool stuff for millimeter waves, I'll explain in a second, and also uh, for smart sensors. All right, so for the millimeter wave, now you may not be familiar with what a millimeter wave is, but as we move into 5G, uh, our radio waves have to get shorter and shorter and shorter, and that is a real challenge for conventional technology. It's very hard to build circuits and antennas that work for millimeter waves. But everyone wants to go there. Right now, FCC just opened up 28 gigahertz as a new uh, frequency band for 5G. We need new electronics, new devices that can handle that. Okay. And one of the things that we need is a switch. We just need to be able to switch a radio wave on and off or switch it from going to this direction to that direction. And it turns out that's really hard to do. And we need to be able to route those things around and so forth. So we have built, uh, hang on a second. So, so we built uh, micro switches that have the best performance of any electromechanical switch of this size. And we demonstrated that first at the university, and now we've duplicated that at the company, thanks in part to our uh, time here at Tech Portal. And we've also built uh, uh, millimeter wave, waveguides, and so forth that can move these things around. We're also building sensor devices. Now, the biggest problem is sensors. We want to put sensors everywhere. The number one problem is power. We want to put sensors because we want them to be all, all be wireless in places like in our air ducts and so forth. But you don't want to string cables to them, so we want them to be wireless. But then that means you have to use batteries. And nobody wants to change batteries every year, right? Because to get a technician to go up into the duct and change a battery, that's a very expensive operation. And imagine you have 1,000 sensors in your facility. So what you need to do is design, design a sensor that requires no batteries, right? Or design a battery that never runs out. And that's what we do both. We design sensors that require no, zero power, they can reflect their power from an external source. And we design batteries that never run out. They use energy harvesting. They connect, collect the energy from the environment and keep the battery charged up forever using the same manufacturing technology to do that. So on the left is some of our early energy harvesting uh, devices. And here's a wireless sensor that never needs a battery. So we've been very uh, fortunate to get these going. And these are our two major projects now, our micro switches for millimeter waves and our sensors that require no power or that use energy harvesting. Now, people ask me, what kind of company are you trying to build, Mark? Are you going to be the next Intel? And I go, no, we don't want to be the next Intel. We, we don't see ourselves as an Intel. We're not a semiconductor company. I want to be the next Siemens. I see us as an industrial company. Okay? Because we don't just want to build little things that you know, someone puts a package on and we sell for five cents. Because that's what Intel has to do. We want to sell things that enable the next generation of industry. right? And those sell for a lot more than five cents. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I think GP got a great party going here already on Thursday night. So, and great talks from uh, uh, Edit and uh, Mark. So, my name is Byron Shen. I'm the CEO, CEO of Velox Biosystem. Uh, just want to tell you, Velox is the Latin word for velocity. And I'll explain a little bit more, okay? And uh, so, a little bit about the history of Velox Biosystems. Uh, as GP mentioned that we graduated from uh, Tech Portal and also UCI Cove. 
And so the technology came out of uh, uh, Professor Wei and Zhao's lab uh, at the UCI uh, in collaboration with LFD. And uh, then we were incubated at the Tech Portal and got a lot of help and support uh, from Tech Portal. So we really appreciate it. And uh, so a little bit, uh, so actually we were featured in the uh, Interface magazine, uh, the 2016 issue. A nice picture of Chris Holloman. <coughs> Uh, one thing I want to mention that uh, because we use microfluidics technology, so we, we, we actually had uh, a very good use of the, the microfabrication lab here, and we still use it. Uh, so that's a great resource to us. Uh, the other benefits, I think the GP already mentioned, so I will not belabor all those uh, points, okay? All right, so what do we do? Okay, so a lot of times you have a great technology, but the first thing is say what kind of problems or questions trying to address? So for us, we are a diagnostic startup company. So we're asking, uh, asking ourselves a simple question. We say, can a diagnostic technology achieve great sensitivity or exceptional sensitivity with great speed at the same time? The answer is really no today. Uh, most of the current technology today, they usually have to trade off one for the other. They cannot achieve both at the same time, okay? So if you can do both at the same time, of course you open the door to a window to a lot of other applications opportunities. So I'll tell you a little bit more here. And uh, so how we do this. <coughs> uh, so this is uh, a schematics of our IC3D technology. Uh, it's a droplet digital detection technology. And uh, uh, so basically uh, we process uh, crude or raw uh, biological sample into micro droplets uh, using microfluidics chips and uh, in combination with uh, fluorescence uh, reagents to label the target of interest, okay? So this has been around for quite a while, okay? This is not really new, okay? The novel part is that we have this high throughput 3D volumetric scanning and we can scan hundreds of millions of droplets in minutes, okay? So all of a sudden, you can scan tons of more droplets and you can do it much faster. So now you can get to that sensitivity and speed, okay? So that's really the breakthrough here. And, and by doing that, now we can find a needle in the haystack accurately and quickly, okay? And so there is uh, this uh, Nature Communication paper uh, by Professor Wei and uh, that's a, a, a very high impact paper, and, and because of that, we got the received the NIH uh, our own grant and uh, to uh, further develop this technology for uh, infectious diseases and other applications. Okay, so just to explain a little bit about the principle, why would you do this uh, micro droplet approach? And uh, so this is the famous way to do right. So, all right, so uh, I, I actually don't know where he is. <laughs> it's a pretty slide, right? And, uh, and the problem is, if you, even if you scan, say, the top quadrant, and you say, okay, he's not there, and, but the problem is, if you go to the next quadrant, he's probably moving back or whatever. He, I mean, all right, he's mobile, right? So the strategy here is really to say, all right, can we partition that space into grids or enclose the sample into micro droplets, okay? And now the target cannot move. Okay, they're gonna stay in that micro droplet. And now we can do some interesting chemistry in that micro droplet to light up, label that target. Yeah, so just show some videos, not as fancy as Adidas, uh, beautiful as Adidas video, but this is a real video, okay? And uh, this is showing that uh, we are using uh, microfluidic chips, uh, making uh, micro droplets. And right now we uh, have really built up the expertise in uh, microfluidics and microdroplet generation. Control size, uniform size, and very stable microdroplet, so we can do a lot of different things with it. And I think that uh, when I listen to Mark, I'll say, gosh, we have some other ideas. We want to talk to Mark later and uh, do some other fancy stuff, right? Okay, so uh, um, uh, here's another video showing you that uh, how we do this 3D volumetric scanning. And uh, so basically we have this, uh, instead of moving the optics, which is gonna be expensive and complicated, and uh, we move this uh, cuvette of hundreds of millions of droplets in front of the optics of the focal volume 
and we spin it up and down on 360 degrees. So this way we can scan through hundreds of millions, millions of droplets very fast. Usually we just do 90 seconds, okay? And we can find, theoretically, we can find one positive droplet out of one billion droplets. Okay, so that's kind of sensitive we're talking about and very fast, right? <clears throat> All right, so now say how oh, we have a great technology and you have a great hammer, you know, the Thor, the movie, you know, the powerful hammer, we just threw it, right? So we basically say, okay, we're gonna go for some really, really big opportunities. This is, you know, billions, 10 billions, whatever, right? And uh, so, uh, so, one, so three areas were the focus areas for us. One is blood, uh, bloodstream infection of sepsis, huge medical problem. And uh, today, there's not really a rapid uh, detection technology, a product today available for doctors. And the wise the patient come in, they can crash, they can go into shock in a matter of hours, okay? So, uh, so that's a huge problem there, crying out for solution here. Uh, another, uh, another area we're looking at, uh, a lot of you probably have heard of liquid biopsy. And uh, so instead of doing tissue biopsy or surgical biopsy, taking blood sample and to see if there's circulating tumor cells uh, circulate, circulating tumor DNA in blood. So it's much easier to do, much faster, and uh, so and uh, both as uh, uh, detection as well as a post-surgical, uh, post-treatment monitoring uh, application, okay? So, so this is huge, this is gonna be huge. Uh, another application we're looking at is a UTI, a urinary tract infection, that's a huge problem. And this one we're looking at primary care uh, product, okay? And we also have several other partnership projects with uh, uh, leading global companies, pharmaceutical companies and diagnostic companies. So we have a lot of things going on, very busy. So you have a great technology and you need to build a great team, okay? So uh, to really make things happen, right? And, and this is really multidisciplinary approach. So we have a multi, uh, multidisciplinary team here. Uh, we have some key expertise here. And uh, also we still have access to UCI, resources at UCI, okay? So that's great for us. And uh, we, uh, so early this year, we moved into a new lab, a uh, new office in Irvine. Uh, just some pictures of, uh, show you some pictures, labs. And we have an open office uh, space. We have a lunch learn every other week. Talk about new things, new ideas. And uh, we have a nice little uh, conference room, and also a break room, okay? Coffee, free flowing coffee, for, <laughs> right? And uh, where we are at the moment, uh, we actually have a, uh, clinical pilot study that's gonna uh, kick off in January, February. And uh, also we have the UTI, we're already going to clinical trial with the European partners. So we're waiting for some clinical trial data and then we're going to go out to raise series A, okay? So that's where we are, okay? So I know that, uh, um, so I mentioned about, you know, we, we were the UCI tech portal, so the portal to entrepreneurship and then we're also at the UCI Cove as well. We were able to use that space very nicely. So, so now we really, and also we really kind of made a lot of the, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, that was great um, setting for us to like a network and to get visibility. And, uh, and we certainly have got some really nice visibilities and uh, got some award, nice awards and so on. And, um, and with that, I think I'm kind of getting close to time. And I want to, one minute, okay, I just want to finish. I'll just stop here. I do have some backup slides, but I think let's not go into too much detail, too much weeds here. And just pausing on this uh, philosoph philosophical slide on droplets, and, uh, okay? And right now we're trying to swim out, uh, we're gonna sail out to the ocean, okay, the blue ocean, and uh, go for this billion dollar, $10 billion opportunity, okay? So thank you, yeah. Good evening. I'm Nancy Kenyon. Um, I'm with Applied Innovation, uh, School of Engineering, and School of Computer Sciences. Uh, but I spent all of my career in industry. I spent about a decade uh, as a strategic consultant for the Fortune 200s, and then I spent the next two decades um, working for Fortune 100. And my last stop was uh, running a 
Navy line of business for nuclear submarine technologies, the onboard networks, the drone technology, communication packages, and so on. Well, when, uh, but I've worked with technologies all of my career, and uh, I'm an alumna of UC Irvine, and I find myself back here working with technologies and loving it. So um, part of what we're gonna cover today is uh, applied innovation, and uh, several people have mentioned it earlier. Um, we're a business incubation um, um, portal, uh, or the uh, organization, and we support people like um, GPLE's uh, tech portals, as well as other startup companies, and I think Velox touched upon it, and we'll show you a couple of other use cases tonight about um, how they go through the system. Um, also, before I forget, uh, if any of you in the audience is interested, I brought a couple of these booklets that uh, Applied Innovation published on uh, Startup Guide for um, if, if you're interested in uh, doing a startup. Um, the most important, I think, or most useful page is the la last page where it has uh, contacts for um, UCI startups if you're interested in asking a question about conflict of interest or IP, et cetera. So part of what Applied Innovation does is all of the patents um, that UCI publishes goes through the intellectual property office uh, at Applied Innovation. Um, also, we're chartered with engaging with industry to accelerate the innovation process for our ecosystem, not just the UCI students or the UCI startups. Um, and uh, similarly with the startup uh, ecosystems and entrepreneurship, and we'll show you part of what that means for us. And you've all seen this um, technology, um, relatively speaking, lots of funding at the front end and at the back end, and the middle is the famous uh, valley of death. Uh, but I think the challenge is why. What, why is there a dearth of funding in the middle? And part of what we are trying to do is part of our hypothesis is that there is a lack of uh, quantitative measurement around relevance and, and quality in the middle uh, because it is more than a basic technology. It's not yet a business. And in the middle is uh, lots of ambiguity. And uh, applied innovation is trying to de-risk that portion by by bringing in a, an industry and potential uh, customers up front uh, to help accelerate through that process as well as providing some funding. So part of, um, and I think GP mentioned uh, some of his leverage as well, uh, these are uh, funding that went into startups that are affiliated with UCI. Uh, so they're either using UCI uh, technology or by UCI people. And I don't know if Velox is here. Uh, but this is uh, based on last uh, 12 years, um, and most of it is in the state in the region. Um, but what we're finding is the rate of change is accelerating. So like almost nearly 37% uh, of this kind of activity happened in the last two years, uh, and the rest was the previous 10. So um, part of uh, programs that we have uh, that we offer um, to UCI-based technologies are these, and I'll go through a little bit of them. And you could be a UCI startup by um, doing one of two things. One, you either license the technology from uh, UCI, um, many of these companies have, or um, you have a U UCI person, and a UCI person is a student, faculty, uh, staff, or a graduate. Uh, so it's a broad definition of a UCI. Uh, and if you satisfy uh, any of those, uh, you have access to many of, these uh, many of these programs. So BioEngine, which many of you in the room know about, it started out as a senior capstone project for undergraduates in biomedical engineering department. Um, stands for Biomedical Engineering Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, the dean opened that up to rest of uh, School of Engineering this year, and uh, next step will be opening it up to uh, Computer Science School, uh, and then after that, potentially to the rest of the campus. So the students spend a year in BioEngine, 
um, getting a project and uh, developing a product around it. They can use a UCI IP and they work with faculty or they can come up with their own. Um, and they don't have to win, but they have to enter student competitions. Uh, so inculcating thought around how to build a business plan, how to go about getting funding, what it means uh, to develop the market and understand your market and customer needs. Um, there are student competitions or faculty or um, there's three of them listed. New Venture Competition is a uh, Mirage School Business School based competition. Bill Butterworth is engineering and computer science students. Tech Surge is a specific uh, UCI IP based uh, competition and you can win one of these to help you get started. Pop Grants are PI based, uh, principal investigator based, so they're faculty lab based kind of competitions and that one goes up to 125,000 in terms of grants. i uh, UC Irvine this year is an i site and uh, doing that uh, qualifies you to go for a national i grant of 50,000. So that's sort of the formation stage and then we have set wayfinder programs and other incubators that we work with and I think uh, Mark mentioned EvoNexus. Uh, and capitalization. We, um, there are multiple VCs uh, resident at the Cove. Uh, NEA, the largest, or uh, known as the, uh, the largest um, VC fund in the United States, about 20 billion, 500 plus uh, exits, uh, is now also a resident at the Cove, as well as uh, Tech Coast Angels, K5, um, and Golden Seeds. Uh, there are several. And, um, there's a, we're creating an ecosystem where technology, uh, company formation, uh, funding mechanism is all resident uh, in one place. So, uh, and the, the funding is heaviest at the formation stage um, because we believe that talent is, and I think the companies also believe, talent is just as important as the technology at the rate of change and the first mover advantages that uh, market uh, awards, uh, you don't have time to build a team and just buy the technology. So we pay a lot of attention to talent growth as well as technology maturation up front. So maybe we'll go through one of these. Uh, Center is a uh, therapeutic device company that uses stem cells to treat diabetic foot ulcers. And they actually, the idea actually germinated to the left of this chart when they were undergraduate research program, a uh, Europe uh, program. Uh, but it really matured as part of their senior capstone project as part of uh, BioEngine. Turned out that they won uh, one of the two com uh, competitions within BioEngine, got a $14,000 award, and they es immediately established a company. Does this work? Yep. Uh, and um, they enrolled in a, a Wayfinder program, which is a six-month program. You have to apply, uh, but um, once you apply, everything else is sort of uh, provided for you. The space at the Cove, the programs, access to uh, uh, expert in residence. Uh, there's 400 plus of them at the Cove. Um, so all the mentoring and, and um, help is part of the Wayfinder program. Did you go through the Wayfinder program? You were before the Wayfinder. Uh, Cove Share. Cove Share, okay. Uh, and then they, and they're still in it. Uh, they went through the i uh, program uh, in 2016 and they ended up winning a couple of competitions, local competitions, and they recently won a, an SBIR grant, uh, phase one grant. Um, Center had a specific capitalization strategy that was non-dilutive, so they are specifically going at it this way and they have other grants, so they're going after the grant strategy. Um, this is a, another company who went through a different path. They started with an i um, They're still in the Wayfinder program. Uh, they also received an SBIR funding and they're now a resident um, at the Cove. So um, I didn't include it here. Um, there are many ways, if, if you're interested in getting um, uh, involved with these companies or these programs or volunteer, um, there are many ways for you to get, get involved and please um, contact any one of us at The Cove or me, nancy.kim.yun at uci.edu. Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Apologies in advance. I used a deck that my partner had used at, um, at Notre Dame. So if you see a logo for the, for the fighting Irish, please disregard that. And there may be, this also has been used with LPs, so there's some overlapping content, so I may be switching over um, slides here. Cool. Uh, should I just raise, raise a hand who's a founder in the audience? Just so I have an idea of who I'm talking to. And, and then investor? Okay. By the way, if anyone has any questions while I talk, please let me know, because I'm not sure I can fill the whole 10 minutes. But uh, so Crosscut, I'll give you a quick overview. Crosscut Ventures has been around since 2008. We're based in Venice. Um, seed stage fund, I guess pre-seed to early A, but we can argue semantics in terms of stage. Um, we're now in our fourth fund, which we'll be announcing in a couple weeks. It's a $125 million fund. Average check size is one, one and a half million, sector agnostic. Uh, pure, oh, we have kind of an aversion to, to hardware, so hardware, uh, but we do software. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so generalist fund, um, three out of the four partners have been operators, have been in LA for two decades and you know, try to be the company catalyst in SoCal. 65% of our founders are based in SoCal and the rest are across the country who like to co-invest with funds that are similarly sized as us. So I'll skip this, but it, it's kind of nice to know the background of, of VCs because, um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it should be a two-way street. Founders are pitching venture investors, but uh, you should also share with us the kind of partner that you're looking for. And just for context, um, similar to private equity, we take carry. Uh, we also have operating expenses from our LPs. Um, and so in terms of like founders always ask, well, why did you pass or what's your feedback? Sometimes it also stems from um, the mandates or the sort of narrative that we've pitched our LPs. So I only mention this as context as to where we come from as VCs. Um, <laughs> so this is my partner's title, but we suck at picking winners. Um, we're usually wrong, uh, <laughs> which, which is kind of a, a nice thing, I guess. But um, uh, we like to, the, a bad day for us is when, when we invest m more money when a company is, is sort of uh, still figuring it out or you know, a bridge round has, has, has connotations to it. Um, and, and those are the other instances. But in terms of venture, uh, you've all sort of heard the theory of, of, of the investment theory of behind venture. If you sort of have uh, one winner, it, it's sort of the strategic uh, mindset of venture investors. Um, just to give you a quick lay of the landscape here in LA and Orange County, um, you know, pre-seed has now become a thing. Uh, Wonder Ventures is also a, a new fund that uh, if anyone doesn't know Dustin, you should. Um, but pre-seed, seed, and later stage, uh, you have the few, I would say, six funds in LA. Um, we only have Upfront and Graycroft, Graycroft up there, but Pritzker, March Capital, um, and we sit in the pure seed stage, uh, two to three and a half to four million dollar raise. Um, and I can go into more context as to what we look for um, at the seed stage. Those are my partners. Um, all three of the four have been former operators. Uh, in Clinton, for example, is COO of Square Enix, so we actually invest a lot in live streaming content esports. Uh, Brian was in content and commerce, and Brett was in ad tech. And so, as a result, we couldn't really figure out what we wanted to focus on, so we're general, a generalist fund. And by the way, um, I do find, and this is a learning that I've had since joining Ventures, having that operational background has helped. Um, I spent some time at Uber as well, and I didn't expect the, uh, the sort of organic assistance that I provide the founders as a result of that background. I just am find myself more helpful to startups building for the new sort of AV world and TNCs, or even just introductions uh, to industry. Um, I won't bore you with the macro trends here. Um, 
the thesis for Crosscut has been ge ge geographically focused, um, as I mentioned, but we are now branching off into other geos. Um, the LA market for us has definitely been a big, uh, a big significant focus, and we're now finding a lot of institutional LPs um, focused on the trend of where SoCal is going. Um, these are not the categories that I would have sort of picked, but um, in, historically, this is kind of how we've broken our portfolio in, tr in terms of retail tech, software, uh, media and content, and I sort of think of on-demand as tech-enabled services, um, but uh, can't ignore blockchain now, and deep learning is, is definitely something that, or applied AI is something that we've been active in. So here's a quick overview of CrossCut 4 um, that we're now investing out of. This is CrossCut 1, 2. This is actually interesting, just as a note back to my context as to who we are as an venture investors. Ownership is definitely a thing as well, so understanding who your investors, um, how your investors think about their ownership and what they optimize for, because that will impact uh, the fundraise amount and how you structure around. And so this is just the layout of our portfolio in terms of uh, the ownership construction. This is just a quick overview of the downstream um, trajectory of our seed companies and where we've taken them. Uh, and you can, you can sort of see the brands up there, but that's a big part of our job as well, is helping our founders with downstream funding. Let's see. So um, I think the topic actually was how do we decide um, on companies and what do we look for? So this is, this is my partner's slide here, but I think it basically comes down to a big part of it is the founder. Um, Wink is uh, a sort of vertically integrated wine business. And I think what he was trying to get here is you know, failure does help. Uh, not, not to say that we look for that, but it's definitely something that um, we know and realize is part of the reality of being a founder and the ups and downs of being a startup. Um, I'm going to skip this. So going back to the initial questions, and I, I'll, I'll speak more to this, but you know, a lot of these, these words have already been discussed, and you guys already have context from, you can just quickly read any, any blog um, out there. But uh, for us, it always does come down to these three big categories, and I'll get more tangible with, um, with some of these examples. Um, Deep Current was actually the first deal I was on when I joined the fund. Um, it's using LSTM neural networks to automate data entry. And for us, uh, a repeatable and applicable use case of deep learning to that was, a, that was actually relevant across industries. So they had pilots in finance, insurance, and manufacturing, and uh, had a diverse pipeline. And so for us, that was very appealing for this, this new kind of technology that was a buzzword. Um, so that was definitely uh, an easier decision versus a company that was coming to us with a black box sort of AI service offering that we couldn't envision as a product. Um, and going back to the team, I mean, the founder actually wasn't really central casting. He was a Juilliard trained or uh, professionally trained musician that traveled the world and got in a major accident and taught himself how to walk. And that was an interesting feature and obviously brought on a co-founder that was highly technical. So that, that combination to us was, was quite interesting. Um, this was another company that I worked on that we haven't yet announced, but pet telehealth, uh, the reason why we did it, change in regulation, um, you can now get prescribed after seeing a vet in person. Um, and you would, it's kind of unbelievable how irrational we are as pet owners and how much money we're willing to spend uh, in the market. And so this is a new kind of business model for, for pet owners. And um, the space for us was super enticing, not just because of how much spend there is, but also the acquisitions by, incum by incumbents. Um, as examples, PetSmart and Chewy. PetSmart acquired that e-commerce company for $3.3 billion. Mars acquired VCA, which is a brick and mortar uh, veterinarian agency for $7.7 .7 billion. And the high, the, there's definitely a margin opportunities to expand and white label into medication and food. So I mentioned these uh, as examples just because I think it's, it's, it's nice to, to bring some tangible details to how we think about looking at early stage startups when it comes to you know, the market and the product and the team. Um, and then the last question that they wanted to talk, me to talk about was just how, to, how do you grab attention of investors? And for us, it's definitely one, is this going to be a venture versus non-venture business? Um, it's, that's 
a difficult question to, to parse out and some, one that we would work with the founder to figure out whether the, the opportunity is, uh, you, you're creating new behavior, creating a new kind of market. Um, I think definitely understanding your space. Uh, the questions we always ask and, and never want to hear is we have no competitors. You, you have some form of competitor, even if it's just status quo, even if it's an indirect competitor. Really understanding the metrics and the runway and the operational plan that you're going to use to hit the next downstream funding milestones that gets you to the Series A, Series B, et cetera. And that's something we also work with the founders. But having those conversations with investors in the ecosystem um, helps you build the case rather than working in isolation. And that leads me to the last point, which is build a relationship. Uh, at least that's my style. I think other investors have their own preference. But um, even just familiarity, uh, we understand that there are real people, real lives behind these PDFs and decks. And we understand that there's, it's just a challenging um, position to be in as a founder. So investor updates is a nice tactic. Um, being a known entity, entity in the community, um, understanding strategically who do you want as part of your syndicate when it comes to the investor profiles that you're bringing together. So I kind of rushed through that last part, but happy to chat um, at the end. I filled it. Okay, so now we're gonna start the Q&A session part of the evening. So um, why doesn't everybody give another big round of applause for our presenters as they come up to the table here. And we'll do, we'll do Q&A and um, what I want you all to do is raise your hand and we'll come around with a microphone. And you know, while somebody's asking a question, a question's, question's getting answered, catch our eye and we'll make our way over so we can have a continuous stream of questions. And um, now, we don't have name tags on the table like we usually do, but the back of your agenda has everyone's name with a picture. But in case you want a reminder, this is Brian, Aditi, Mark, Michael, Nancy and GP. Um, so anyone, so go ahead and raise your hand and uh, let's get started. There are no stupid questions, but if you ask one, I'll let you know. Hi, my name is Bolek Bochkai. Um, I have a question for Rick, but all the uh, uh, participants are welcome to add. Um, my question is with the, how does one, let's say, an inventor or a founder find the right um, partner, if you will, or a specific uh, VC fund? Because you specialize in certain area. If I understood, like software, based uh, ventures as a more general question how would one whether it's in software or another area say i'm in this area this is what i'm looking for in terms of a partner how do i find a partner which person was who are you asking oh he wasn't here that was for michael mm -hmm. oh sorry yeah i heard i heard rick i didn't know uh, I, no, no worries. Um, how do you find the investor? That's right for your. Sure. As opposed to someone else. Right. So yeah. So the, broadly speaking, the question is, um, how do you find the right investor? I think it depends on. So yeah, knowing your product and service, and knowing the stage at which you're at, and like I said uh, on that slide that I rushed through, I think going to a lot of events. Um, Reading and going online, the investors kind of put out there what they want to, what they cover. So you might have a fund that invests in deep tech. You might have a fund that invests only in SaaS. Um, and it's honestly, it's it's getting in front of these investors and kind of getting them to give you the real take because sometimes those websites are very broad. They invest in businesses that are scalable and make a lot of money is, is all they probably should say. Um, so I think going to their blogs, um, listening to the podcasts, going to the events that, that venture folks host. Um, we, we do a lot of events, and so just getting in front of them and build, building that familiarity, because 
I mean, I know the investors at 10.110, they're in LA, they focus only on SaaS, but I've seen robotics deals with them and an AR deal with them. And so it's not always, if they don't see something that doesn't fit their wheelhouse by, by sector, that they'll just not, you know, not invest in. Um, so I, I, that's kind of a, a vague way to answer your question, but I kind of wish I had more specifics, but yeah. Let me tell you from the entrepreneur side, since this, um, I'm doing this quite a lot, not with this comp just with this company, but with previous companies. So I think um, you definitely have to uh, leverage your network. I've, um, I've never talked to an investor that wasn't introduced to me by someone else. So uh, otherwise, you're just throwing something over the transom and no one's going to talk to you. And also, I wouldn't, uh, just like you don't want investors to just make assumptions about you based on your website, I wouldn't make assumptions about them. So getting in front of people and talking to them, getting them as a, as a human being, the way I tell my students who are also entrepreneurs and quite successful, is that uh, this is someone that is going to be on your team. Once, once this paper is signed, they're on your side now. Is that someone you want on your team? So money is one thing, but they're on your side. You're, it's like getting married, right? So and make your, your selection very carefully because you want someone who's going to really pull for you, go to bat for you, who's going to really, they're going to bring a lot more to the table than just a check they can write. They're going to actually um, make introductions for the next investors and for other people. So, so to me, it's like a human relationship. And so, how do you meet people, right? Well, I, I assume you're not swiping left and right. You know, you're out there talking to people, right? So, that's the, the same. Well, and I'd like to chime in as a support organization to um, uh, small companies. Um, get a good mentor. Um, there are companies that will only invest in later stages and other VC firms that will only do early, se early seed. Um, or Series A. So, so there are different companies, not just by the industries in which they invest, but the, the uh, phase in which they invest. Um, and if you want to get to company X by Series D, um, by making different choices up front, uh, you may never get there. So, so there, there are intricacies in this industry that, like in any industry, so that's one thing. Um, the other advice that um, we often give out to um, new start startups is uh, whatever you do, you don't mess up your uh, cap table, right? So like Mark just said, um, you take on a difficult partner who is difficult to work with in, in the formation stage. Um, not only can he or she hold you hostage at a later stage, but that kind of ownership will shoo away all potential investors, right? So um, like Michael said, if you mess up the first basic background pattern, there is no way to fix it. You mess up that cap table and your partnerships, it's hard to fix down the road. Yeah, if I may just add uh, um, a quick comment here. Um, so. Uh, so I think you know you guys already made some really great points here, but there is a really uh, good book um, about how to work with VCs, and it's called Venture Deals uh, by Brad Feld, and uh, you can uh, get that from Amazon. Uh, I think it gives a very good overview kind of how to work with VCs and uh, develop relationships, stretch deals, and uh, it's a very very good introduction and overview. So I have I have more, um, sorry, I have more examples now. I thought about it. <laughs> um, Crunchbase and PitchBook are very specific, good websites for you to go look at their portfolio companies. And you can also see the, the stage at which they participated. And you can get a better sense as to where they invest, what check size are they usually writing. Um, in terms of podcasts, 20 minute, 20 minute VC is something that I listen to um, every week. And it's just a young teenager who's interviewing venture folks all over the world and getting their take on what they invest in, how do they think about companies, et cetera. So those are three good re resources that I would lean on. Anyone else have a question? Oh, great. Uh, Nancy, I just wanted to confirm that any uh, one who graduated like a, with a PhD from UCI can get into your program? Uh, that qualifies you 
for the program, but most of those programs are application-based, which means, you know, you yeah, have you to have be, like them. <laughs> you, you have to um, get accept, admitted, right? But yes. Thank you guys for, um, for your presentations. My name is uh, Jeffrey. I am not of a technical background or a business background. I just have an idea with a few friends. Uh, what I'm kind of looking for is kind of like a mentorship. It sounds like maybe from what I've read, like an incubator, pre-incubator type of experience. Are incubators looking to pick winners and choosers, or winners and losers right off, from the, from, you know, right off the bat? Or are they looking to, you know, look for good ideas that they can help grow and nourish and help develop a business plan and things like that? That's actually something that I can communicate effectively with you guys. Um, how does that process work and where do I even go to start that? Maybe, maybe I can uh, answer the question. Um, I have been an uh, entrepreneur. I had a uh, five-stop company over the years and four out of five failed. Right, so um, I think most valuable lesson I try to give to uh, whoever come to the tech portal space is to share why I fail. Right? And I believe failure is a catalyst to succeed. And that is the way and really get some of the uh, entrepreneur excited because it's, uh, we know, we always heard about the successful story, but behind that there are so many tears. Right? So, and I'm the one to really, I, I can go up front to tell you why I failed and to be a sort of a negative mentor and tell you what is uh, the pathway you should not do. And that's learn from the lesson why I failed. And I think that has been helpful to uh, many faculty members because it's usually, as you know, faculty, um, we are the one to give out the grade. So usually people joke about we are the one next to the God. So we assign the grade, we do everything, right? So, um, so uh, we have to really uh, think outside. We are not the authority because there are so much we need to learn in the business world, how to form the relationship, how to build up the trust. I think it's, uh, everything we talk about here is that trust, the relationship. And how do you really go about that? And we earn that trust throughout the process. And a lot of time, we see is uh, we have the idea, we try to perfect our idea, and we hesitate to try. Well, I, I think it's uh, the only way I can see is uh, just go out there and fail fast. Right? And so <laughs> out of uh, my students, I have a four student now, a CEO in public traded company. I wouldn't take a credit from them, but I, I can take a credit because of my failure helped them to understand something they should not learn from their advisor. Right? So I think it's for the mentor, you, think, you have to always think about anybody surround you could be your mentor if you're willing to listen, willing to give a try. And you will find your pathway to succeed. That's what I will give to everybody. So if you have any questions, come to Tech Portal. We are willing to work with you. And we do have a lot of uh, connection in the, uh, um, in the community, in our ecosystem. So we can help you say, hey, why don't you talk to this person A or person B and find a path for good for yourself? That's uh, my advice. One practical thing. Have you been to the Entrepreneur Center on campus? A-N-T-R-E-preneur, like entrepreneur, but with A-N-T for anteaters, right? Check it out, it's designed for people who just have no clue about you know, being an entrepreneur, they're kind of interested in it, maybe they have some good ideas. It's right on campus, David Ochi is the uh, director. He's a great guy, go talk to him. And then they can put you in the right direction. So that's a good, very tangible starting point. They're also connected to uh, applied innovation, so they could be a pipeline. There are many uh, ways you can enter this, right? You can. I think he's a medical student. It's okay, you can come on, it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> yeah, sorry, come anyway. <laughs> we have several um, startup companies in the Wayfinder program right now who are uh, headed up by either staff or um, practicing um, MDs from our medical school who are in the program. So it's doable. This is also a good uh, opportunity to remind 
to remind you that <clears throat> before you start telling a lot of people about your invention, you should write it down. <laughs> we call it an invention disclosure form. Surprisingly common for surgeons, it's a cocktail napkin. <laughs> but uh, seriously, we've had, um, we've had someone come to us with an invention on a cocktail napkin and they hit 500 million in revenue in 10 years off a product. But seriously, yes, you, you should be writing down your idea and you should think about filing it even as a provisional application before spreading it around because you, you can uh, lose your rights very easily. So we can talk later about that, but sorry, next question. Nice job to all the panelists, and thank you, GP, for that um, point about failure, because right before that, I was going to ask, can each of you list an example of when you've had a failure, <laughs> and, and what was that failure? You know, because we, GP said it, you know, if you're going to fail, fail forward and fail fast. But, you know, failure or pivoting, you know, it's just another term. I mean, I've yet to meet a startup that hasn't pivoted at least one time. So if the panel could give examples of when they've either failed and how that's led to their success, current success, or when they've had to pivot and realize that that was a, a moment of transition. Okay, I think that's a very good question. And um, uh, so I just mentioned one example. Before I joined Velox, I was working on another startup project uh, very cool technology and uh, using big data, deep learning, and uh, for cardiovascular diagnose, uh, diag uh, diagnostic application. Um, the technology is great, and um, I was ready to basically set up the team, bring in the investors, um, basically ready to go. But I, at the very end, uh, I was like, okay, I need to think about this because I was concern about a business partner I was working with at the time, and I just felt he was not reliable enough. And uh, so, so before I jump in with everything, I kind of think I make sure I just take a pause here and uh, reassess the situation. And um, uh, because for me, that's uh, once I put together a team and bring the investors, then I have a huge responsibility to my team and to my investors. And uh, so I'd rather just say, if I'm not sure, if there's a lot of red flags already going on, I probably should just pass and uh, reconsider. Yeah. Um, so I had this experience kind of early. Um, so when I kind of wrote the proposal for my SBIR, uh, the, we kind of told that the primary target we are going to have is for education. And we want to like, you know, part of the plan was to kind of have things deployed in the schools. But very early, I think within three, four months, I kind of realized that education is probably the hardest place to start because, you know, the user base is um, kind of inexperienced, right? Um, and there is pretty much people have a lot of other things going on to really come and adopt a new technology, right? So. Uh, it was kind of became very evident as soon as I started talking to some of the folks in education, starting going to the schools. And though it's a very attractive story for NSF funding, I have to kind of go back and convince my program manager that, you know, if we have to do a business, we probably have to go to a different place and start with kind of a new, new point, right? Uh, so it was kind of very, very early. I didn't really anticipate that, but, you know, kind of did that and recovered and kind of tried to steer it in another direction. I failed a lot, so which story <laughs> you want? Lots of stories. Um, I'll tell you one, though, I think it's kind of relevant. It's a good lesson. Uh, about uh, six years ago, I had this great, really great technology that we developed here for studying cancer cells on microarrays. And you can in study individual cells and determine the best treatment for breast cancer. Uh, we were able to raise $2 million on that. It was great. Uh, what caused us to fail was the team. We, um, we put together a team, and there's all people that actually like each other, but um, it wasn't a good team. And then when, when things got sticky and stuff like that, we kind of all fell apart. And not everyone was fully committed. You know, people had different faculty positions and things like that. So uh, it basically 
fell apart because the team was not cohesive and strong. And you will never find a perfect team. Everyone, but you've got to, what I learned is you've got to be able to manage. You've got to create this uh, culture that even though not everyone agrees and not everyone's on the same page, that you're just going to stick it through and make it work. And so now, uh, that, to me, that was a huge lesson learned. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd probably fail every time I say no to a company because it's, it's a hard decision. But I would say the most tangible one I've had in my career so far was uh, my first exposure to entrepreneurship. Uh, I was just bored in my first job. I was in consulting. And I started working on a startup with the founder nights and weekends and worked on it for a while, like two, three years before I went to, to grad school. And um, pitched angel investors and was working on the business plan for too long. and had some traction, but it was we were too much. We were trying to prepare for too long. I guess this is a long story short. Um, it was a great lesson learned because it exposed me to the whole world of venture and sort of redirected my career goals. But uh, I, I definitely think the working in isolation on a, an idea, um, there's pros and cons to it. And for us, it, it was definitely the, the disadvantage of just not realizing that maybe we should pivot faster than you know than we did. at um, uh, new venture competitions or um, startup weekend and, and I've uh, been judges at several of those. Um, good idea is a necessary but insufficient condition. It, bulk of what we look for is you stare them in the eye and you have to believe this is a team that's going to pull this product, great idea, to market. And you've got to believe that there's a customer there somewhere. So a good team will have done some work for customer verification, market verification. But it's really about what Mark said. 80, 85% of the score is about, do I believe in this team? Can they pull it through? Do they have the focus? Do they have the experience? And do they have the stubbornness to get it to market? Yeah, <laughs> I, I give you one. I, I think it's uh, maybe most of us don't think about it. Is uh, don't be greedy. Uh, that's is uh, the first one. Uh, as you remember, in year two thousand, the dot com age. Right? So it's uh, everything is uh, was uh, crazy, right? So the valuation is so high, and you are on the top of the world. And back then. Our company raised $90 million to give out only 10% equity. That means the valuation is $900 million. Right, so, and other company offer M&A for $300 million. I said, oh, they try to short cut our values. Don't sell it. Then you know, after the bubble burst, we have zero. We lay up 100 people just within a year. And back then, we have the market, we have people say lining up, say want to buy the product. But when the market evaporates, that's something we cannot time. Right? We really don't know the market. So sometimes it's, we are on the top of the world, it's, uh, but that sky can fall down. Right? So don't be too greedy. And when you see it's, uh, it's about right, but you never know when it's right. right? So, and, and really, I really don't know how to tell everyone, say, you, you feel, say, maybe I can look for the next one. So don't be too greedy. OK, next question. Hi, very nice presentations. My name is Alex Boyko. And this question is Mark touched on it a little bit in, the, in his last answer. So. How do you manage your time? Because many of us are faculty here, some are students, some are postdocs, and you have a brilliant Eureka idea, you want to start the company, you want to file the patent. How do you manage your time? Because you still have commitments to university, and now you have a company kind of inceptive, uh, so you have to also commit the time to company. How do you manage these activities? Does it mean you have to give up one of those? Can you manage two of them together? What's, what's your suggestion here? Well. Since I've been in your shoes, I'll tell you, 
Um, honestly, if you're going to stay a faculty position, uh, in a faculty position, you shouldn't take a leadership role in the company. You should trust the people that you brought in, whether you're postdocs, you're graduate students, whoever, and let them take the leadership. That's what, what happened with Flint, Flint Rehabilitation. Two of my students started this company. They're doing really great selling rehabilitation devices, and I am a minority share in the company, and I'm an advisor. That's the correct way to do it. Uh, in the case of integrity advisor, I left the university. I'm not at UCI anymore. And I can tell you that makes a big impact to when we talk to potential investors and partners, because they know I'm all in. And there's no backup plan for me. If that doesn't work, I'll go find a job somewhere. But that shows commitment, right? So I think you really have to decide, is this a hobby or is it the real thing? If it's a hobby, let someone else take the lead, step back, be the, on the advisory board or so forth. But you're not going to be able to do both well, so that's my advice. I think as a Mark has an excellent point. If you're a faculty member, think about when you are become entrepreneur, there are three jobs you have to fulfill. One is teaching job. Second one is uh, your staff company. The third one is uh, your family is another job. Right? So you are talking about divided 24 hours into three major jobs. And now or then you can compromise. So you have to really think through how you're going to divide your time and fulfill your commitment. I think that's usually the advice I give uh, to uh, everyone who want to be entrepreneur. Think seriously, how passionate are you? Are you committed? But it doesn't mean so you cannot do it. Right? So we have seen many successful stories, but they have thought through before they start. I just wanted to let you know that there is the leave of absence, so if you really want to take some time to think, right? How I want to do it and maybe at that time have a little less load in, the, in your uh, faculty job. I think that's a good way to kind of take the time to see whether you want to take a back seat and kind of let others lead or you want to do something else. Sabbatical. Yes, absolutely. The most of faculty, they, they would take a one year sabbatical, right? As a way to set it up, So the, uh, the food and the bar is open, but so we could take one more question and then um, we'll break. Someone has a burning question. All right. Um, I don't know if this is a good or bad question, but uh, is it better to approach a uh, more saturated market, uh, if, you ha if you have any ideas, or better to try to approach it like a more niche kind of a market? Uh, I guess my initial thought is what are you trying to sell for? Um, are you trying to build a lifestyle cash flow business? Are you trying to appeal to venture investors? That's the first, what's that? Soft more, more software? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I software such a broad thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of yeah, I'm trying to think of an example. So, okay, so so the telehealth. Uh, I, sorry, I'm like all about examples. So the telehealth startup that we ended up deciding on investing in, the current market huge, but the largest players it's super fragmented. The largest players had less than 10% of the market. So there's a long, long tail here uh, to sort of consolidate, um, and. And so when you think about that, I would say, and, and going back to what I was alluding to with the, but the market, like have a thesis on why your, your software, whatever it may be, um, is appealing to the stakeholders, customers, partners, go to market channel partners. Um, and for me, it's really understanding the incentives too. So I'm kind of rambling, but I, I would say fragmentation is good, uh, especially for marketplaces. Um, again, it's hard to give you a definite answer without understanding the other aspects of your idea. Um, so software is just, it's too broad for me to like give you, I, you know, I don't wanna say one way or the other. Um, but I would, I would definitely recommend before you go start a company to just to do a landscape of like, read the S1s, right? And understand the market cap of, of some of these incumbents and look at some venture funded startups to see how well they've been, how sophisticated are their investors, um, infer from how much they've raised the traction that they've had to date, how long have they been in the market, um, et cetera. And that will give you an idea of, of what the competitive landscape looks like. Um, 
and, and, and to your question earlier too, I, I actually read, uh, a, a, I'm all about reading, but Stratechery is a really good um, resource, uh, a blog that the guy just pontificates on technology and strategy. And um, it's, it's an amazing read. He builds investment theses on content, commerce, media, the direction of, of, of a lot of these industries and how sort of, you know, Christian Clayton, um, Clayton Christensen's book and, and these uh, principles of innovation apply to certain sectors. And so I, I like to think about sectors that way, but that's, that's always a good resource. But I can, we can talk more specifics if you have more details about your idea. All right, well, let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. Uh, to everyone outside, and uh, enjoy the buffet and the bar. <laughs>